Good morning, everyone. Thanks for being here today. On behalf of the WKRP core team, I want to welcome you to the Western Klamath Restoration Partnership 2021 Spring Workshop. I know it's a busy time of year for a lot of us, so thanks so much for taking the time to be here today. I want to jump right into some webinar logistics and make sure that my um, slides are working here. Perhaps you're familiar with this Zoom webinar format. Um, if you're not, I want to assure you that we can't see or hear you. So if your cat is jumping across your screen or your kids are playing in the background, um, there isn't an audio or video option for participants. But you know, we really do want to hear from you. So if you could take a moment, introduce yourself in the chat, that's the option. It should be at the bottom of your screen. You can tell us your name, um, where you're calling in from today, or uh, position, if that's appropriate. I also want to point out um, that another way to interact with us today is with the, the Q&A option at the bottom. So at the end of each of the morning and afternoon sessions, we're going to have a panel to answer those questions. So I'm sure the speakers would really appreciate it if you had put some questions in there for us. Also, we're recording the webinar today, and we'll be posting it to the WKRP website. And another thing about the Zoom webinar platform is there are there's a view options um, tab at the top of your screen, I think. And oftentimes, the speaker view is a good way of um, getting the best experience for these workshops. So just want to go over briefly the schedule for today. In this morning session, we'll be talking about the, our plan, what we have going on, and what will be happening in 2021. I want to assure you we will have a lunch break, and then in the afternoon, we're going to do a deep dive into some of the projects we have going on and really get some more uh, depth into those. Right now, I want to turn it over to Bill Tripp. Bill is one of the WKRP co-leads. He's also the Director of Natural Resources and Environmental Policy at the Cudic Tribe, and he's going to do the welcome for us. Thanks, Bill. Hello, everybody. Um, thank you for, for joining us on our um, Western Climate Restoration Partnership uh, workshop slash webinar this morning. Um, we're going to be going over a, a few things around our strategies and our um, project development activities uh, today. Um, and, uh, you know, with uh, the current situation, uh, we all are probably realize is pretty dire um, out there in the world um, with the changing climate and uh, 100 plus years of fire exclusion. And, you know, the work that we're doing here um, is critical. Uh, to addressing uh, some of the big picture problems um, that we are seeing, such as fire behavior on the Slater fire last year, um, and the devastating impacts that's had. Um, that said, um, even with um, such devastation, um, there can be opportunity uh, if we can get ahead of um, the discussion and and uh, create a system of, of work that uh, will enable us to to do so. Um, you know that said, you know, looking to um, actions like Black Oak Stand restoration uh, can help us move fire impacts um, during northeast wind events above town like that um, into uh, large scale February burns instead of. Um, instead of large scale burns in uh, August, September uh, during wind events um, and low humidities. So hopefully we can gain a little bit of ground on that front um, and expand uh, out to our entire WKRP landscape in, in uh, doing so um, and um, make some good things happen uh, to protect us from those things in the future as well as revitalize um, our indigenous knowledge practice and belief systems 
um, that have been employed on this landscape for, for thousands of years. Um, we have a lot of people that want to pass um, skill sets like basket weaving on to future generations. Um, and without those black oak woodlands and hazel uh, patches and, and uh, so much more, um, it, it uh, becomes difficult, if not next to impossible to do. So I just want to thank you all for joining us today. Um, and I hope you uh, get uh, out of this meeting um, everything that you want to and feel free to throw as many questions as you would like um, or comments um, into the, the question and answer box. And, um, Enjoy the day. Thanks so much, Bill. Look at my slide loading here. So this is workshop number 21. It took me a minute to figure that out. Um, perhaps some of you have been to all of the previous 20 workshops. Perhaps this is your first one. I had fun uh, looking at these photos from from our past workshops and you know this year is the first year where we've used the webinar as the format for the workshops and I definitely feel like these photos represent the more natural habitat for WKRP participants. There's so much value in us all being out in the field together, being able to, to hear which animals and birds are around us and to see all of the plants. And you know, we've certainly done our share of uh, poring over maps and action plans, uh, rural cafe style. But it's so important that uh, we do have a chance to meet with folks again. You know, we skipped a workshop last year, so it certainly seems overdue, this workshop number 21 and really appreciate everybody taking the time to be here and want to assure everybody that we do plan on getting back out into the field and in person as soon as we can. So one of the reasons why these um, workshops are really so important is, as many folks know, WKRP isn't an organization you know, of itself is not a fiscal entity, but it's more of a collection. It's a, co a coordinating body, I think is the way that Jody refers to it. So Jody Pixley is our partnership coordinator. And this year she created a, a summary of the WKRP governance structure. And in that really, she outlines, if you don't know that We've made a conscious decision as partners to not have any formal charter or agreement, but to have um, you know, this shared collaborative process be a part of that. So the core team has been working um, after these series of 20 meetings to implement this vision, which is up here, and to come up with a plan for how we're going to do that. And this workshop is a really important opportunity for us to bring that back to this larger group and make sure that we're checking in and, and that we're on the right track. I do think that there, there must be something right about this process because even after all of these years, I still really love this vision statement that the group came up with. And I think what really speaks to me in particular is this focus on the revitalization of continual human relationships with our dynamic landscape. And I don't see that as being part of the vision of a lot of partnerships. And I really appreciate you know, that that is a huge part of what we're doing and looking forward to being able to share what we're doing with everybody today. So after the flurry of initial workshops where we had so many in any given year, we've slowed down and now we're only doing these workshops annually, but we do wanna make sure that we're still able to engage with everybody. So Jody Pixley did put together our first annual report and perhaps you've seen it. It is linked on our WKRP website, which is wkrp.network. We hope you can check it out. Also, we did do a webinar earlier this year, last month, and it was really fire focused. And so that'll be posted to the website just as soon as Jody and I can work out some of the logistical issues. And hopefully you can check that out there as well. So for the workshop today, 
the core team has been working for several months to put together the WKRP work plan for 2021. And the way that's been organized is based on these strategies that the partnership came up with at one of those 20 workshops. So there are a lot of them. Sometimes it seems a little bit overwhelming, um, but for the strategies one, two, and seven, those are largely project focused, and that's going to be the what's happening this afternoon, the second part of this workshop. Um, but I really appreciate everybody who's volunteered to speak today, taking time um, to prepare for this presentation. Um, we'll get through these strategies. It's, it's a, it was fun to put this together, and we're looking forward to sharing it with you all. So I know I said we weren't going to talk very much about uh, strategy one, two, or seven. It will be the focus um, of the afternoon workshop. But I just wanted to put the projects, these landscape scale treatments for strategy number one into a bit of context. So we are going to talk about the Soms Bar, Icaria Tui Ship, Orleans Community Fields Reduction, and our fisheries restoration projects later. But that's certainly not all that we're doing, and I didn't want to leave you with that impression. We, uh, last year, put together a 10-year work plan, and some of the bigger projects associated with that work plan are shown here in this table, and all of the projects are shown on the map, which shows the WKRP planning area, and the different types of projects are, are shown in different colors. It's an ambitious plan. It seems like everything that the partnership does uh, is ambitious. We certainly want to increase the pace, scale, and quality of the restoration we're doing. And, you know, so developing these projects, being instrumental in developing the NEPA for them is definitely one part of that, but that's only one part of the strategy. So the, the partnership's also using other NEPA-ready projects and identifying funding to be able to implement those. The uh, bare grass burn photo there is from a roots and shoots burn um, from Six Rivers National Forest that really focuses on basket materials. There are um, invasive projects. We uh, definitely support programmatic NEPA. There's a fire and fuels type programmatic hopefully being developed with Six Rivers, as well as aquatic NEPA, doing lots of invasives work basically looking at any projects that have NEPA but might need some funding for implementation in order for us to continue to meet our objectives. And the, the projects we're talking about today are really national forest system focused because so much of uh, our planning area is in the national forest system, but we do have a lot of other projects going on tribal and private properties as well. I promise I'm not gonna read this slide um, strategy two for us, increasing fire use, is a huge part of what we're doing. Like I said, we did do the workshop last month, and I think that Eric Dara, who's um, speaking next, can also talk about increased fire use when talking about increasing our workforce capacity, our restoration capacity. And Will Harling will be talking later on today as well about fire adapted communities. I just wanted to put this up here for reference. It's certainly a lot of what we're doing is this goal of um, getting good fire back on the landscape. So I wanted to make sure to let you all know that uh, there are these objectives related to that strategy. But right now to talk about local restoration capacity, I wanna introduce Eric Dara. Eric is the WKRP Prescribed Fire Working Group Lead, as well as the McClamath Watershed Council Fire and Fuels Program Director. Eric's been with us for a few years on our team and has been invaluable to us increasing our restoration capacity. So it certainly seems appropriate that Eric's the one to uh, talk to us today about that. Thanks, Eric, for taking the time to be here. I know it's burn season. Yes, yes, it is. Just in time. It looks like we're gonna get some, some much needed rain over the next few days. And hopefully that leads to a favorable burn window for some late spring, early summer burning, which we'd like to do in some grass models around the area. So it's a busy, busy time, but this, uh, this seems valuable. So I am just looking, I'm gonna share my screen here. Um, let's do 
that way, that way. All right. So strategy three, training and workforce development. Um, you know, when I came up here, I, I moved up here in 2019 and um, quickly learned the difference between hiring and finding a workforce in an area such as Orleans Soames Bar versus uh, the Tahoe Basin, where I worked before. Um, when you don't have a huge employment pool to pull from, it becomes increasingly difficult to fill positions that are needed. Um, you know, it's it's not for a lack of individuals wanting to work. It's for a lack of individuals. Um, we we don't have the the infrastructure uh, being homes, reasonably priced homes, and uh, places for individuals to live up here. Um, that allows us to have, have that bigger hiring pool. So working through training and workforce development has, has kind of become one of the focuses that I've been been working through and trying to figure out how do we how do we get high paying jobs here that people want to stay at and, and where do we put those people? Um, so over the last few years, um, you know, we've come up with some some ways of doing that, keeping people employed and keeping people engaged. And so this picture here at the, at the front, this is something that, that mostly the tribe took on this year and their fire and fuels program. And it was pretty amazing. Um, they took on a lot of work to do this, but they put out a full spring slate of NWCG classes for free for individuals to sign up and take NWCG certified courses. And so this was a basic uh, 32 or yeah, basic 32 class. Uh, this was a, you know, the graduation of it at the completion of it. And so this just illustrates, you know, some of this training that we, we say people need to come do this work. Um, we need to take the reins on that and provide it ourselves, um, really push people in that right direction. And so um, when we look at our, our restoration and, and increasing that capacity, there, there's some events and strategies that we can utilize to, to do that. And, and these are all things that we're, we're going to continue into the future here and, and take even more of a, a focused approach on. But you can see here, this is a list and we'll hit on all these. But, you know, we do events such as treks, um, the Klamath River treks annually. Um, that has adapted into this all hands, all lands kind of model at times, especially during COVID when we weren't able to, to stand up a fire camp and bring people in from the outside. We, uh, we adjusted a little bit and we'll go into that. Um, utilizing training locally, uh, NWCG classes, as well as specialized local training. You know, we, we don't need certified instructors and we don't need to be doing the national requirement for wildland fire all the time. Um, we are individuals, we do have these individual communities here and specialized local training is just as valuable, if not at times more valuable. So utilizing opportunities to train individuals, um, not only so they learn, but they could go on and teach others. Uh, the utilization of local contractors has been a huge one for me. Um, it's turned into, a pain at times, but the value in employing local contractors who then employ a local workforce is, is pretty valuable on our projects. They have a good understanding of our um, needs, wants, desires on that landscape. They understand this, the cultural concerns, um, the species, and also you develop a working relationship with these individuals that that can pay off in the end. So really trying to find that funding and those local contractors and, and then utilize them at all, all means necessary, try to get them out there and then plan projects and seek funding that support utilization of the local workforce and equipment. Um, so Trex this last year was, was a, little, a little different um, due to COVID. Again, we, you know, in 2019, we had 100, uh, 120 to 130 participants from all around the world uh, kegged up here in, in Orleans. And we were, you know, 
uh, breathing, eating, sleeping, all in the same area. And obvious for obvious reasons, that wasn't able to happen this year. And so we adapted, right? Instead of just saying no and missing the opportunity to, to put good fire back on the tra- on the ground and train people, we we stood up our local team. And this is something that we've been trying to develop for years now through our Trex program, uh, the Klamath Trex, we, we were standing up type three teams for a reason. And, and that reason was that when the time came and we had to take you know this into our own hands locally, could we stand up a team? Could we manage an incident? Um, a lot of that was with, with a focus on wildfire use, you know, in season type three. full resources service resources um are at a drawdown and don't have personnel to manage a fire and so the desire is that we would eventually be able to supply some of that needed overhead and incident command support but with covid it gave us an opportunity to try that out um on a trex and so we stayed very very local um we did have a burn boss come in from colorado jeremy bailey with the nature conservancy uh, he was the individual that came from out of the area, the one. Um, we needed a, a burn bus. Jeremy was willing to quarantine for two weeks. We made all that work. And so the value in having a, a certified burn bus from another organization here was worth it to us because we need to continue our in-house training. So we had 30 to 60 participants, depending on the day. Um, this wasn't a every day you're out there kind of thing. This was utilize the windows that we had. Um, we, you know, training was available for firefighter two, all the way to RXB two. Um, everyone gained prescribed fire experience during this. Uh, we utilize a lot of local resources this time, um, for obvious reasons with COVID, but also, you know, this is what we were talking about is, is pay our locals, keep the money in the area, um, increase capacity here. And so utilization of local resources during treks has been big. And then utilize resources to burn understory and piles. And so this, you know, moving into 2021, again, we're talking about burning possibly next week. This all kind of falls under this treks window. Um, Our plan last year was all hands, all lands through the spring, summer of 2021 um, with a hope that COVID will ease up and the restrictions will be such that we can do a a wider reaching event in the fall of 2021. And so again, we are reaching out to our neighbors, um, you know, our our close neighbors to find who needs training, who's available to come as a trainer, who has equipment. Equipment sharing is huge for us. our local capacity can help our neighbors build capacity too. So this all hands, all lands model that we moved into, you know, it's much the same as Trex when we talk about training. Um, it's, it's not as organized. It's not down to a certain set amount of dates. Um, these are a little inter- interchangeable up here on the river as you would assume. So all hands, all lands and treks are, are, they're two different beasts, but they have a lot of the same goals, right? So we, it provides opportunities more often, but less guaranteed, meaning, you know, there's, there's opportunities to burn throughout the entire year. Um, It's not guaranteed that you're going to be able to make that window as a trainee or trainer. And so there's some offsetting, my bad offsetting uh, positives and negatives there. Uh, It increases the likelihood to put fire on the ground at the right time, at the right place. And so you'll see us talk about all hands, all lands, a lot more moving into the future. It's pretty much the mindset we want to be on any time, you know, outside of that specific two weeks of treks, if you will, or, you know, maybe August. Um, But other than that, we should you know, always have this on our mind. Can we pull people together to put fire down in this blackberry patch or in this tan oak understory? And and are we going to develop training 
and knowledge out of that. And so this also really helps with our local capacity as far as contractors go and our local, you know, volunteer fire departments, um, contractors with equipment. Uh, this model is where, you know, we're going to call up OVFD or Lean's Volunteer Fire Department or Happy Camp Volunteer Fire Department and, and put one of their water tenders, let's say, on contract for a day um, before we go out and have an outside contractor drive all the way here and be here for a few days. And um, this just makes a lot more sense for us. This here is just an attached flyer of the treks this year, moving into the spring of 2021. Um, pretty simple, um, but you, you see here at the bottom, the, the slate of partnerships that go into this. These are all organizations involved. All of them have special skill sets that they're able to pass on and they're all missing something they're able to learn. And so when we come together, we're able to share that knowledge and train each other. And so this has been a, a great experience for me. Um, it seems to work really well. It oftentimes provides opportunities to individuals that no, otherwise wouldn't get them. You know, we can't all be on wildland fires all summer long, um, learning how to sling weather and program a radio. Um, but we can be doing this in the fall, so or the spring. When we talk about in-house training, um, you know. We're, we're slowly developing these, these systems that work. Training takes a lot to put on if you wanna make it valuable. And it's something that I think people have a tendency to underestimate the amount of time it takes to put on a class or even a one day training. You know, a one day training for individuals is two to three days of commitment for the people teaching it, if you wanna do it right. Um, but seek the funding, you know, we're seeking that funding to make sure that works because it is important. And so this picture here, just a little background. This is a, a intermediate leadership course, uh, L280. It's an NWCG course. There's a field day associated, it, associated with it. Every individual in the course has at least one opportunity to lead other individuals through a multitude of exercises. And so this is called the, the minefield, um, just a little background here. There's a lot to it. We won't get into how that game's played, but this was training, again, that the tribe hosted. Um, it was an NWCG course. As you know, our partnerships were involved. McWick was involved in helping teach and facilitate. Uh, we had students from all over the land and backgrounds involved in this class, but you know, we had the avenue to put on NWCG classes and we took the time to do it. Um, it was a really good, good course. And, you know, we opened that up to the employees and the public. And I think that's important right there is opening this up to the public. Um, again, in a, in a community that lacks a bunch of horsepower from personnel, um, getting as many people trained up, even if they don't work day in and day out for you training them on the basics of some of this stuff so they can assist when needed is huge. Plus it gives you, you buy in from your public, you know, get, get individuals out there understanding that we are taking a lot of this seriously and, and we do train on it and we do develop uh, young minds. So, and then provide locally specific training to employees, public and contractors. Um, same reasons for employees and public as before. I think it's it's all important. Find those locally specific individuals with a specialty that can put on, even if it's a half hour class. You know, we we we're trying to focus on on some of our cultural stuff, um, looking at you know our new geo databases and mapping software that we're starting to use. Um, so these, these little trainings are valuable. Um, we are recording, not recording them through video, but you know, keeping a record of, of what we do there. And, and these can be deliverables in our grants. So 
and with contractors, you know, this is big. We don't, we don't have enough people to supervise contractors every minute they're on the ground. And so if we have, especially outside the area contractors, um, we're taking the time to educate them on our local concerns and points of interest and, and, you know, educate them on the, the EA for SOMES and the prescription really walk through that and then, and then take the time to go check up on them. But if you're going to do a formalized class, if we're doing formalized class, inviting these individuals is a good, a good stretch. Um, looking at the work that we have, have left to do here. Um, <laughs> there's, there's long-term relationships to be built. And so pulling them along with us in the training is a good thing. Uh, this is the training schedule that, you know, the tribe put on and, and mostly I'll give a lot of kudos to Scott Steinbring with the tribe, the FMO. Um, he took on a lot here. This, this is a lot of classes to put on, on top of your day in and day out job. Um, so they, we've learned a lot of lessons. Um, a lot of things have gone well. I will say looking into the future, we we're, we're going to have to figure out a way to, to get deposits or, or something for these classes. You know, people see free, sign up for free online, and they tend to sign up. Whether or not they have any intention on making the class is another, another issue. But um, overall, you know, learning to teach through Zoom, learning to learn through Zoom was an interesting hurdle. I really look forward to the day that we're all back in the physical classroom and we're able to do some of this in-house. Um, and we continue this with not only our employees, but our, our public. And so, whoop. yeah. So then the utilization of local contractors, you know, for me um, on the SOMES project, and I think, you know, for, for WKRP, it's really important that we take the time to educate and work through these, these local contractor issues. Um, there, you know, here in Orleans, in Soames, there's two local contractors I've been dealing with, working with. Um, their crews are, are, you know, five to 10 people. They, they, they're not slow on the work, but you know they work at their own pace, and and we could always bring in twenty five person out of area contract crews that do twenty acres a week, and there's times where that heavy lift is needed. But taking the time to build up our local workforce it is big, and so whenever possible, utilizing these individuals, uh, support them as needed. You know, I pay our local contractors at times unit by unit instead of for their whole contract is because they don't have the money to pay their employees, but they want to be out there doing the work. And so we find some of those, those give and takes, right? So um, there's three local contractors that have been awarded contracts in the SOMS project that they're currently working in there. Uh, there might be more, you know, I'm talking pretty big picture here to local uh, Russian crews and then the, the local logger. Um, so there might be individuals doing some sort of research out there, something I'm not aware of, but it, in the, the implementation side, you know, we're utilizing these individuals. Uh, additionally, these local contractors have been awarded private lands contracts to fill downtime between public units. And so this is a focus, you know, trying to keep people employed and not just with our organizations, but in the community um, because it matters around here. It matters to keep people busy during the day. Um, it matters to get them a steady paycheck. Um, and it's important to build this, this area and this community as we move forward. So, um, you know, I, when we're writing awards here at Makewick or writing uh, grants at Mickwick here. They're, we're always shoving some private lands units into a contract. So we fill some of, you know, a 50 acre gap with a, a contractor and that's much appreciated by them. 
and it, it takes that workload off of us for, for a little bit. Gets more done on the ground, right? So, and then plan projects and seek funding that supports utilization of local workforce and equipment. You know, something that we, we have to take note of is it does cost more. Um, the local equipment that we want to put under contract is going to cost more. They don't have the opportunities that somebody in Reading has. They, they're not getting paid consistently. And so it costs a little bit more. It costs gas costs more out here. Equipment costs more. Everything costs a little bit more. And then local workforces cost a little bit more. Um, so when we're writing grants and when we're planning these projects, if, if this truly is you know, something that we are committed to, we, we have to, to swallow that, that pill, if you will, and understand that price per acre might be $200 more than the cheapest price we can get. Um, but are we okay with that? Especially cutting down drive time, um, keeping, keeping that money local. I think it pays off in the end. And so this picture here is, is of the lower camp burn. This is when we were setting up the hose lay. And well, you, it's just nice because, so it's the Orleans volunteer um, water tender, their brand new truck. We put that under contract for a few days. They were able to pump our entire hose lay with that. It has a, a really nice pump on it. It cost us, um, it, it wasn't too outrageously expensive and it did the work of probably two or three engines. Um, so it, it paid off and then it made sense. Plus it, it just turned around and provided our volunteers who respond to our house fires and our car wrecks. Uh, it provided them some income, which you know they oftentimes need volunteers in any area. Then the UTV there is with the watershed center down in Hayfork and that's a partnership where you know they want to come up and burn, so they brought that plus their Type Six engine, and that was you know establishing that look. It's not local as in a few minutes away, but regionally local uh, workforce and partnership that are willing to come help with burns. And then you know these folded tanks are, I think, ones they might both be Mickwicks, but either way they're within the partnership. And as we accumulate equipment like this, this, you know, these things can be used across the board. And so um, getting some of this stuff in our communities, not only for the projects we're doing now, but you can use these for weed wash stations, you can use them during high severity. Uh, fire weather, you know, in the summer for staging water at certain areas, along with our burning and whatnot. So you know, building a local cache of equipment that we can all use is, is important. Um, is there any questions or Luna, do I toss it back to you now? Yeah, thanks so much, Eric. I know yeah. that what you presented really represents the work of a huge team. So please pass along our appreciation to that multi-organizational team that helps make this all happen. I uh, will. I'm glad you mentioned Q&A because I was just going to say, please uh, to, to participants, um, since there isn't a video or audio option, we're hoping that folks can put questions into that Q&A and we'll answer those questions at um, the end of the session today. And I will move on to our, am I sharing my screen yet? Let me try this here. Here we go. Okay. Um, so certainly part of uh, capacity is related to funding. Strategy number four is about creating sustainable and diverse revenue streams. And I'll be honest, it's kind of boring to talk about funding after all of those great photos that Eric was showing. I did wanna you know, just put up some of the objectives we have related to that and wanted to mention that WKRP was in the top tier ranking 
for the CFLRP, and that's the Collaborative Forest Landscape Restoration Program. And if that funding is awarded, that's a federal funding source, it would provide uh, potential funding for our 10-year work plan. That's a long-term funding source. So we do have high hopes for that funding, and it does address several of these objectives, including it, one of the great things about that funding is it isn't as siloed, so it's not just forestry, um, but it includes in-stream projects, uh, a lot of the forestry work we're doing invasives, education, and addresses capacity as well. So we have high hopes um, for that funding. And I am hoping that if there is any particular question that attendees may have about funding, that you could please put that in that Q&A and we can talk about that in the panel. So strategy number five, Accelerating the Development of Fire Adapted Communities. It's my pleasure uh, to introduce Will Harling. Will is one of the WKRP co-leads, and I also serve um, with Will Harling in a co-executive director position for the Mid Klamath Watershed Council. And I appreciate you taking the time today, Will, to talk to us about fire adapted communities. Thanks, Luna. I hope my satellite internet supports all this video and, and presentation work. It's been dicey with two kids who are doing remote schooling all on Zoom together every day. So um, Luna, please jump in if I get too choppy and, and we need to uh, figure something else out. Uh, uh, I'm gonna try and share my screen here. Let's see, I think I want this screen. I'm going to share that and we're going to go into presentation mode. Um, uh, does everyone see that that first slide on there of the presentation right now? Yeah, we see it, um, but just the slideshow hasn't started yet. Great. So uh, I am. Uh, lucky to talk about the uh, strategy five, accelerate development of fire adapted communities. Um, oh, I see what you're saying. It's, you're still seeing the, the non-presentation version. Exactly. Is that correct? Okay, I think I've, uh, I've shared the, the wrongs. <laughs> I've got three screens going right here, so. Uh, uh, let me figure this out. The good um, news is your audio and video are still working, so. Oh, good. Okay, I'm trying to figure out what screen will be best to share. Maybe this one. <laughs> okay, now what do you see? And so now I'm seeing the presenter view. Will, I think the one you had before, I'm sorry, I should have said it, is probably the correct screen to share, but you hadn't hit the start slideshow button yet. Okay, Did yeah, I mean? for some reason, um, when I hit the start slideshow, it starts on a separate screen. Oh. And so, which is, yeah, so that's the, the tricky piece that I'm trying to, <laughs> figure out here. So maybe I'm just going to unplug all my multiple screens because that way. <laughs> well, if it ends up being, we can make peek it. into the inner workings of Will Harling's presentation. I'm sure that'll work too. Uh, well, um, forgive me all for, for this um, little delay, but I think, I think this is going to work. Now, are you seeing the presenter view? Dang it. Or, or are you seeing the actual presentation? It's still the presenter view, but I mean, it, we can still see it quite well. Okay, one, one more try here. I'm gonna figure this out. Aren't the first one this has happened to, it happened at our fire workshop as well last month. And what we ended up doing was in the first one you shared, Will, you can just flip down through those slides and that should work as well if you can't enter the slideshow view. Okay. I think this is it. That's it. Okay. So, um, 
I accept it. Oh, there we go. Now, my final question is, do you see this bar on my screen that has people in it that's kind of blocking the, no. the slide? No, we don't. OK, good. So um, just you know, to remind folks, strategy five um, had a list of actions that we had prioritized, that the WKRP core team and members had prioritized to work on in 2021. And these actions are grounded in the principles of the National Cohesive Wildland Fire Management Strategy, um, which has you know, the, the three uh, legs of the stool of fire adapted communities, safe, effective wildfire response, and resilient landscapes all joined together through science and management. Um, and, and I think perhaps no other, at no other time in history has it been more important for people to understand how these three pieces fit together. And the, the reality is that we must learn to live with wildland fire on this landscape, which means choosing frequent fire on this landscape and figuring out how to transition from the current fire suppression paradigm that we've been in for the last century to one that utilizes both cultural fire and prescribed fire as well as managed wildfire, coupled with uh, fuels treatments, strategic fuels treatments um, to allow fires back on our landscape again in a good way. And so one of the strategies that we employed was supporting cultural burning and indigenous fire stewardship. Um, and perhaps um, one of the greatest examples of groups regionally doing that is the, the Cultural Fire Management Council, the Yurok treks that happened this spring. Margot Robbins and Elizabeth Azuz hosted a wonderful event that uh, many members of WKRP participated in, including uh, the Karuk tribe, uh, Mickwick, Orleans Volunteer Fire Department, and others. And, you know, it's just incredible to see what can happen when we create space for, for putting culture fire on the ground. Um, this, this was a, a great burn uh, down in some of the best remaining black oak woodland habitat that we have in this country. And you can see still here in the picture in the middle ground, what's about to burn, you know, that little clump of firs that's, that's coming in. And it just felt so good to put fire on the ground, you know, at the right place and the right time. I think this was um, late March when we did this burn. Yeah, it was actually on my dad's birthday a few days before he passed, but I couldn't say no <laughs> to, uh, to get in a day, uh, putting good fire on the ground with those folks. Um, another action of WKRP that was led by the Krug tribe was to put together this uh, good fire, uh, Karuk uh, fire policy paper, which looked at current barriers to the expansion of cultural burning and prescribed fire in California and proposed uh, recommended solutions uh, Bill facilitated this effort and, and was able to find funding for Sarah Clark and Andrew Miller um, from a legal firm in San Francisco to facilitate uh, an all-star cast of uh, participants of uh, you know, fire, good fire advocates across the state to dive into you know, issues specific to tribes, uh, including you know, the, the lack of understanding in state agencies about tribal sovereignty um, and their ability to work with tribes to implement cultural burns um, and the, the lack of recognition and support for cultural fire practitioners. Uh, this report also looked at air district permitting, uh, you know, all the, the barriers that we've uh, encountered uh, and solutions to those barriers. It looked at barriers with CAL FIRE permitting and what could be changed. It looked at issues of liability, uh, specifically the lack of um, uh, burn insurance for groups who are currently implementing 
uh, prescribed burning in California uh, was another issue that we looked at. Uh, it looked at uh, the barriers from environmental review. Uh, you know, fire is, is really uh, something that needs to be done frequently, whereas, you know, the CEQA compliance process, California Environmental Quality Act, Environmental Compliance Act process is, is very cumbersome and takes a lot of time. And so figuring out how to allow us to do what needs to be done when it needs to be done uh, in the current system has, has been difficult uh, at best. Um, and then finally addressing the agency culture, you know, both state and federal uh, fire management agencies just aren't built to work with and support cultural burning or prescribed fire. Um, and, and so figuring out steps forward. And, and I, I strongly encourage folks to look online. If you do a search for Good Fire Karuk Tribe, you'll find this document on the uh, Karuk Tribe's Climate Change Projects website. Um, Shout out to some of the folks that were engaged in this. It was facilitated by Craig Tucker, um, Craig Thomas from the Fire Restoration Group, Lanya Quinn Davidson uh, from UC Cooperative Extension, Margot Robbins from Cultural Fire Management Council, Paul Mason uh, um, uh, from Pacific Forest Trust, Nick Goulette from the Watershed Research and Training Center, Sherry Norris from the California Indian Environmental Alliance, uh, Kathy McCovey from the Karuk tribe and others. Um, and sh special shout out to Don Hankins um, from CSU Chico, Chico, who's a, a Miwok cultural fire practitioner and professor and everything that he brought to that effort. Um, this is a, a wonderful roadmap for how we change uh, fire policy in California and get the resources we need to restore fire process. One of the other things we addressed in the, the working group that are looking at strategy five was um, this effort of the, the pods or potential wildfire operational delineations and, uh, and the reburn effort, which is um, basically state and transition modeling that allows us to look at fire on fire interactions over time, uh, both, um, you know, using uh, inputs based on this landscape, but modeling fire over thousands of years to understand, you know, for instance, you know, what fire would have looked like on this landscape had we never chosen fire exclusion uh, or suppressed cultural burning, and specifically what the, the forest structure would have looked like in that. So we can all have a vision for what we're managing towards, which in my 20 years of beating my head against the, the wall of fire suppression culture is, is one of our biggest issues is that people don't understand and we don't have a shared vision for what that forest looks like that we're managing towards. So uh, the Reburn team, which includes folks like Paul Hesford, Hesburgh from Pacific Northwest Research Station, Susan Pritchard from the University of Washington, our very own Frank Lake, um, Sky Greenler and uh, Chris Dunn uh, and John Bailey from Oregon State University and others are coming down here um, at the end of the month uh, to get their feet wet in our landscape. Um, and just uh, this was uh, some information that Sky put together talking about how uh, the reburns and pods efforts uh, work together. Um, we're, we're really just getting started with this effort. It's probably a three year effort to come to completion. Um, but what we're looking at is, um, you know, we have a developed draft pods layer for all of the 11 counties in Northwest California through NCRP funding. But in particular, we want to look at pods within WKRP and, and make sure that what's been proposed both by the Forest Service and through previous WKRP efforts for the Happy Camp Ranger District, uh, as well as the, what the Klamath has come up with for the, the salmon 
uh, river area, you know, are all fit together and, and are, you know, the draft that we want to move forward with. Um, and then there's an interplay between the reburn and the pods model where, you know, the, the reburn model can help us determine, you know, what level of work we need to do to make those pods effective for giving us more choices uh, for managing fire. Um, I just want to point out at the bottom here, you know, th this work is grounded in a shared understanding that, you know, landscapes in Northern California were maintained by by both cultural burning and lightning, and that models and management scenarios need to include cultural fire management to, to be accurate and useful. And so just a shout out to Sky for all of her work to connect with the Cultural Resources Advisory Board and, and make sure that um, you know, that work is, is grounded in those cultural fire management principles. Um, this slide, uh, looks at the phases of this project, and we're you know we're currently in phase one right now, um, developing the key inputs uh, for the reburn model, which is these uh, reddish, uh, orangish, pinkish boxes on the left. Um, you know, developing these the ignitions uh, and the vegetation states and transitions following fire through time, as well as the cultural resources. Um, and for the pods model, you know, developing the values at risk, which is um, still in development for this area, it hasn't been completed, uh, as well as the potential control locations and suppression and difficulty index, which have been completed and are ready for review. Um, and then, you know, this final step of, you know, taking another look at these draft pods and, and adding our local knowledge uh, to those areas. And, you know, phase two will probably be in 2022 um, or, and potentially could begin in 2021. Uh, but there's a lot of work to do there. And there's a, a good team coming together. Um, and some of this work will include, you know, increasing on the ground data um, from fire scars. And, and looking at you know, those transition pathways from one state to the next across the landscape. Um, for time's sake, I'm just gonna um, skip the rest of all this and, and um, you know, move on. But I, if anybody has any questions about how that's gonna work, um, please reach out. This is just a, an example of what the draft pods layers that uh, that the Six Rivers National Forest completed for the Orleans Yukonom Ranger District and how they articulate with the draft pods layers that were done in a, a previous WKRP workshop for the Happy Camp landscape. Essentially, you know, they're, they're following ridgetop uh, features that have been used uh, in the past or may be used in the past for, you know, fire containment um, you know, with, with mixed results. Um, some of these places have not, not been vetted for cultural resource concerns. And, and so that's why, you know, we're making sure that folks understand this is a draft layer and it really needs to go through a lot of analysis before we start using it for management decisions. But it helps us to begin to picture how we make these compartments where we're beginning to manage fire um, for various resource objectives within them and ultimately building resilience to our communities and making place a place for managed wildfire on our landscape. This is a slide from Chris Dunn that shows the both the red salmon complex footprints as well as the Slater fire footprints with the, the potential control location probability uh, layer behind it. Um, so you can clearly see in both of these slides that recent fires uh, play a huge role in, you know, stopping uh, the wildfires that we see today. But also you can see, you know, how this starts to pop out places where we can theoretically, um, you know, control fires or manage, even manage prescribed fires, larger scale prescribed fires to and from. Uh, 
so the the reburn model you know basically it builds a landscape it adds specific types of burn ignitions to that landscape that are you know geographically and spatially uh, located on the landscape and then it updates the, those burned pixels and grows out the fuels and then runs that over and over again and, and remembers you know, uh, the, the supercomputers are using to run these models remember what state that vegetation is in over time so that you can you know run it over a long long time to see the you know the effects of fire on fire interactions so just an example of that using the the cold dry conifer state and transition model um, you know this reburn pathway of, of fire on fire interactions um, you know would would show the effects of those over overlapping multiple fires similar to that map you see on the lower right which is the wkrp map of of fire overlaps that you know was part of our original planning process um, and so that reburning would often decouple surface fuels from the canopy fuels and and made a lot more patchiness uh, to the forest um, and a lot more resilience from from subsequent fires now in the the no fire pathway it it really um, favors uh, stand replacement especially in our current climate situation um, because the you know we exclude the fires that could be reducing those surface fields over time especially on the shoulders of fire season when it's easy to suppress um, and then when fire does come it comes at the hottest driest times of years that that really you know hit the reset button in these stands and, and you can just see, you know, that state 6A picture on the lower right, you know, I walk through these stands uh, and, and it's so sad to see, you know, the next fire that comes to a lot of these late cereal stands is, is going to be a stand replacing fire if it's at all near the close to the middle of summer. Um, and this is just an example of how it tracks you know these various um, vegetation types uh, and and even you know various plant assemblages within these vegetation types over you know thousands of years um, to to get to these specific um, forest conditions um, and so these are the four models that that they're model you know the the four states that they're modeling so the the no fire, you just cut fire off the landscape. We, we know that's not gonna happen, but it allows them to analyze that vegetation succession. Then the modern suppression model that you know basically mimics what we're seeing on the landscape right now, where only two to 3% of the fires escape suppression uh, on the hottest, driest days of the year. Um, and then uh, the, the partial suppression model which is, uh, you know, manage wildfires uh, in the late summer and fall, plus escapes um, with some cultural burning under varied conditions. And then finally, the, the no suppression model um, that, you know, all lightning ignitions that would spread, do spread, um, as well as the, the inclusion of cultural burning. And so this example from the tripod fire just gives you a, a flavor of how much different the vegetation looks in all of these situations. And, and the thing that really drew us to uh, Hesburgh and Pritchard's work was, you know, the, these landscapes that have, have not seen fire exclusion have a patchiness that really resembles the, the cultural uh, indicators from uh traditional knowledge uh, or not indicators but the descriptions of what these forests look like uh, from from traditional land managers cultural land managers um, so moving on from reburn to um uh the cross the other parts of of this strategy one was cross boundary burning in the wkrp planning area um, and I just want to update folks, um, the WKRP co-leads uh, sent a letter to 
Region 5 Forester Randy Moore back in November of 2020. And we basically brought up, you know, three issues, one of them being the the that we needed a drastic increase in, in engagement with the Forest Service and cross-boundary burning to protect our most at-risk homes. Um, I included this map here on the right from our, our CAL FIRE proposal that included one of the, the cross-boundary burns we were talking about, which is in this property. I'm not sure if you can see my mouse, but um, that's, that's Dean's property. Dean, you probably recognize uh, your place. Um, and in fact, that little white dot in the middle of that property there is, is where Dean uh, barely survived the Slater fire that came from the, the southeast and, and burned through his place to the northwest. Now that red blob just to the south of Dean's property there was a cross boundary burn that we had proposed with the to the Forest Service from his upper driveway down onto his private land and, and to adjacent Forest Service roads. We originally proposed that burn in 2016 and, and hadn't gotten any traction on it, um, unfortunately, until the Slater fire came. So, so these are the types of examples that, that really elevated this issue for us. Um, so we have we did receive a response from the Forest Service, and you know they say they're they're willing to engage in these types of burns, both on the Klamath and Six Rivers. However, the the scale of how we do it, uh, the scale of that work is very limited. You know, currently the Happy Cam is engaging us on one one acre cross boundary burn unit for 2021, and saying if that's a success, then maybe we can move forward. Um, so, on, you know, ideally, we'd like to see a, a larger increase in the scale of this cross boundary burning that we can, you know, increase with the, the SOMES project and, and other projects throughout WKRP. We still have a long ways to go. Hey, well, one of the other issues that we brought up was that we are a little bit behind schedule. It looks like you're wrapping it up, though. Thank you for, for weighing in there. I saw a comment pop up and I was going to check it, but I figured I'd just wrap it up. So I'm close. Yeah, sorry for going over. That was last fall when a lot of our federal agency firefighter resources were, you know, burned out from one of the worst wildfire seasons on record and, and on use or lose time. We had some great burn windows to burn. piles in the SOMES project um, available. Um, we weren't able to burn those units because the Six Rivers agency agreements was that, you know, tribal, federally qualified tribal bosses couldn't burn those units. Um, so that was one issue that was confirmed from the region was that tribal burn bosses are able to lead burns on public lands with agency administrator approval. Now there's still social political factors can come into that equation of approval, but it's one step closer. Sadly, it took us a year and a half to confirm a right that um, the tribe already had, but it's a step in the right direction. And the final issue was, you know, ending this policy of region-wide burn suspensions within the Forest Service that first, you know, two of the last three years have had our our Forest Service uh, fire management partners, you know, having to stand down during the good burn windows uh, because of fire activity in Southern California. And so finally, uh, you know, just an update on the CWPPs, which was another one of our actions within the strategy. Um, uh, Karuna and Brendan uh, from SRC have done some great work updating the Salmon River CWPP and that will be released for comment soon. Um, our Orleans Soms Bar CWPP was last updated in 2014. Um, we put in funding to Cal Fire to, to do an update of that. We also have a little bit of funding in-house to begin that update, uh, and we expect to start hosting uh, neighborhood meetings uh, this year. To inform that effort. 
was updated in 2018. Uh, however, it went through a significant change in condition after the 2020 Slater fire. So our current plan is to at least get that 2018 version signed uh, by the, the necessary signatories while we seek resources for a, a subsequent update. So with that, my presentation is complete. And sorry for going over you guys. I'll try to watch them, my time better a little bit next time. Well, uh, Jody finally put a question in the Q&A just to confirm that it was working. Um, we might not have a lot of questions for the panel, so I could have cut you off sooner. But I want to go straight over to Dr. Frank Lake, uh, who is going to be talking about strategy number six, which is integrating food security into our forest management actions. Frank is the lead of the WKRP Research and Monitoring Working Group. He serves as a member of the core team and is a research ecologist with the Pacific Southwest Research Station. So thanks so much for being here, Frank. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate the opportunity today. Do you see my one main slide? Yes, it's beautiful. Is it? It's not. It's an irregular all slide. You don't see my notes, correct? Nope, it looks great. Great. Okay. Well, thank you. So I'll I'll go ahead and jump into this right now. Um, so yeah, one of the one of the important points of the WKRP broader plan is to integrate for the strategy six, integrate food security into forest management actions, and. For that, really, the approach is the integration of indigenous and Western knowledges and science to inform management by developing prescriptions for different types of treatments. The second part or an aspect of that is to promote vegetation or fuel loads and habitat conditions that increases human and wildlife access to and the quantity and quality of species used as food resources. And a part of that is different methodologies to evaluate, uh, to evaluate the effectiveness or the, the effects of treatments. And then the last one there really is overall is to increase the potential of different food resources across the WKRP focal areas. And so just some of the things that I wanted to highlight on that is, you know, this is really a river to ridge perspective. And although we focus a lot currently on the forest management, um, such as like the Soames Integrated Fire Project, where you see some examples here of um, the WKRP Patterson treatments for mechanical is you know things about food security. So for some of you that maybe aren't aware of it, um, a lot of the tribally important food resources here are a range of plants, animals, and fish species, um, and how really these these treatments or the prescriptions that are developed for each type of treatment can improve the habitat of those species in, in tribal and community access and use of those. And so um, the example in the middle panel there between the fish and me with the deer is you know looking at. Uh, the selection and favoring of a sugar pine and the thinning around that, that will reduce competition, increase water availability, soil nutrients, and an ability to use fire around there to promote healthy, abundant sugar pine nuts, which are widely used by uh, people and animals. The second example down there you see with the equipment um, is to favor around legacy oaks, such as a uh, black oak and tan oak as other ones. Um, but in that regard to increase the opportunity to reduce the good competition and, and, and increase light, uh, increase water availability, and promote those legacy oaks that can produce healthier yield to acorns, but then having the follow-up treatment after the mechanical or manual treatments to come in there with prescribed fire to then reduce acorn pest. Um, and then we have other examples, you know, uh, through the tribal knowledge um, about using other indicators such as like Matsutake or tan oak mushrooms and looking at the production of those, evergreen huckleberry and other berry species, whether it's black caps, thimbleberries, trailing blackberries that often need more light. And that's another element of this is um, increasing um, the diversity and opening up areas to increase the light to promote those understory food species. And then, you know, a lot of this work has been led by the Karuk tribe and there's academic and other entity government agencies partners like myself who uh, coordinate with the tribe and WKRP and the Karuk tribe with University of California Berkeley has agroforestry condition assessment plots, many of those located in WKRP units and those are long term to look at the effect of climate and forest management on particular resources such as food and so that's ongoing work with the tribe um, with UC Berkeley. There's other elements of my research um, and working with others too, such as Colleen Rozier, who finished her PhD on the huckleberry, evergreen huckleberry management and huckleberry patch quality. The informing our management strategies are also being incorporated into these. 
So, you know, I think for that, um, both as a scientist and as a community member, uh, you know, I, I, the picture of me or the deer there actually was going by during hunting season, looked across one of the, the units where I had a plot and thought, oh, I have a plot over there and then saw this nice buck and then snuck out, got around and, and got it. And so for me, um, there's proof, proof on the table and in the smokehouse on the benefits of these treatments. Not only do these treatments open up and um, reduce stand density, promote and favor those um, drought tolerant fire adapted trees and understory vegetation and shrubs, but that all has that lens towards food security and honoring tribal fire sovereignty and the use of that as part of this partnership. And so I think the other one there, not to lose sight of these treatments, but eventually as we increase the price and scale of these, it's going to affect uh, vegetation dynamics related to hydrology and water yield and increase the potential for cold water refugia and spring flows to support our at-risk species like these uh, spring salmon and summer steelhead, which would benefit from the upslope treatments. And so that's the, the broader view of some specific examples. And again, um, we have the panel here and I'll take any questions from there at that time. Thank you, appreciate that. Thanks so much, Frank. That was a great uh, snapshot of, of what's happening with that strategy. Um, so as I said, seven is going to be, strategy number seven is going to be highlighted um, in the afternoon. And I am going to share my screen again and talk just a little bit about uh, the most joyful of the strategies in my opinion, the development of integrated intergenerational education programs and activities that complement our identified strategies. So of course, um, what Eric was presenting on, oh, I need to get into my correct view here. What Eric was presenting on um, with the trainings, natural burning is certainly part of this strategy. Um, but when I think of this strategy, understandably, I also think of youth and I, I see kids wearing snorkels and doing data collection, managing invasive weeds, uh, gathering acorns and uh, basket materials after burns. And I think this strategy really gets to the heart of that vision, that revitalizing human relationships with our landscape. And it really works towards our youth feeling like they're an integral part of the landscape. And um, there's a lot I could say about this. It's certainly, I would say, underrepresented in terms of um, the time we're spending today. But I hopefully, um, can, if the internet uh, agrees with me, uh, present very briefly uh, a two minute video um, focusing on intergenerational learning. Hopefully the sound works out. Um, Jody, if there's any problem with the video, hopefully you can just um, let me know. You know, intergenerational learning is a critical part of, of um, why we're doing this. Um, if we're actually going to be able to have species like salmon and that uh, for for thousands of years um, in this place, then then we need we need that to be an intergenerational process. You know, we can get started. We could probably build some social license for restoring that. You know, humans as part of that, you know, fire system in this place. Um, however, that becomes trying to reconstruct but ultimately you know we're we've burned what a couple hundred piles as part of this trex event so far and we need to be getting um 1.2 million acres burned on this on um you know on a, at least a 15 year interval so is that going to happen so in your lifetime that is not going to happen in my lifetime <laughs> is that going to happen in your lifetime then probably not and so, <laughs> so you're going to need we're going to need you guys oh, to, no. you know, maybe it's one or two of you end up, you know, taking on this type of thing. Maybe it's not even someone in your class, but, you know, we try, we're we going to keep keep talking about it and we're going to try to make it a, an intergenerational process. Fire is not for everyone, um, but for those that it is for, um, hopefully it will carry on. Hopefully you could 
actually see that. Okay, I'm going to try this again here. Last but not least, I want to um, introduce Jody Pixley. Jody um, is our fearless leader, our WKRP partnership coordinator. Strategy number nine, developing inclusive partnership for implementing vision and zones of agreement. Uh, Jody makes all of our meetings happen. Uh, she, she's the glue that holds us together and she also does it with kindness and makes it look deceptively easy. So thanks Jody, um, I'll pass it over to you. Thanks Luna. I'm just gonna go ahead and share my screen. Alrighty, um, so in the interest of time, I won't um, kind of go too, too much in depth, but um, definitely wanna leave, leave time for questions at the end. Um, but so yeah, so I'm, I'm gonna talk a little bit about strategy nine, um, which is to develop inclusive partnerships for implementing zones of agreement. Um, it's sort of a, a double-edged, it, it's not a double-edged sword, it's got two sides. Um, you know, we do this, um, internally and, and externally um, at WKRP. And so I just wanted to talk a little bit about the structure of WKRP um, to highlight sort of how we're doing um, doing that and in, in developing those partnerships um, inclusively amongst um, the, different, the different partners. So I just wanted to start with um, how, um, you know, how we're geographically oriented and um, the planning area that you can see there um, you know, we're kind of rooted in three different locations um, in, in, in those are Happy Camp, um, the Salmon River and Orlean Soames Bar. Um, and, you know, additionally, we, uh, the planning area spans the Six Rivers as well as the Klamath National Forest. Um, and I should, I should say that, um, you know, the plan area um, pretty well aligns with the, the Kruk ancestral territory um, as well. And, um, and you know, in working with the um, our projects primarily right now are located um, in the the Six Rivers National Forest jurisdiction, and you can see um, kind of the cluster of of colors there is is where most of our work right now is is um, focused. And regarding the zones of agreement, those are something that. Um, were developed um, back in 2014 when the partnership first formed. Um, they really represent a, a baseline of understanding um, where all partners have agreed um, to kind of um, build from and, um, and, and ultimately really work towards or towards the vision of, of maintaining and achieving resilient landscapes, communities, and economies. Um, but here, the, I included a, a, an abbreviated list of what our zones of agreement are, just to give people any, an idea. So we really focus on, um, you know, really importantly, protecting private property, um, and that includes defensible space and um, creating public and private cross-boundary cross fuel breaks, uh, creating safe and reliable access and egress routes, um, strategic um, implementing strategic control features by creating and, and maintaining, um, creating new and maintaining um, existing fuel breaks and fire sheds and targeting fuel treatments for cultural and ecological resource benefits. Um, and I just wanted to highlight, you know, the SOMS project that we'll be talking a little bit more about this afternoon in the project section, but that it's um, a, a really important project. It's our pilot project and um, is really demonstrating what what we're doing in terms of um, how we're um, implementing strategy nine, but also a lot of the other strategies as well. Um, so again, quickly, I'll just run through these. Um, I just wanted to talk a little bit about how our decision-making structure um, is, is formulated and, and how we're able to translate the collaborative decision-making to 
um, on the ground actions. And um, like I mentioned, the different kind of geographic areas that we're situated in are, um, are referred to as subgroups and the different respective organizations in, um, in the subgroups make up the core team and um, in, in which you can see the list there of, of the different groups um, that, that really do make up um, the core team and um, help you know, um, guide all of, the, all of the project planning and implementation. And then, it, and then I really like, definitely wanted to point out the work groups and all the effort that goes into the folks that are a part of those and um, um, really translate everything on the ground. And so you can see, I, I highlighted in pink, uh, the number of folks and personnel from the different organizations that make up those work groups. So there's quite a few, as you can see, 30, 38, 19. Um, so there's a lot of folks um, working together um, to, to, to make things to, um, to make things reality. Um, and um, finally, and another area of focus of strategy nine is um, strengthening and expanding existing relationships. Um, and so this is more kind of the external um, way that, that WKRP is, is developing inclusive partnerships. Um, and um, there's quite um, a list of, of folks that we do partner with. I just wanted to kind of highlight a few here um, in my short time. Um, but, um, and Eric Dow talked about the Fire Learning Network a little bit. Um, program of the Nature Conservancy and, you know, leader and manager of the TREX program, which is, of course, a, a really important program of ours for local workforce training and development um, and, and things like that, and a program we've been doing for quite a, quite a number of years now. The Lomakasi Restoration Project, you'll um, hear a little bit more about later when Josh Budziak talks about uh, mechanical implementation of the SOMS project. He um, uh, just that partnership has been absolutely critical for for implementing um, our, our pilot project and, and we'll hear a little bit more about that later and as well. Um, I just kind of picked the UC Berkeley. I think that the, the, the value of that relationship and the research that's going on there is incredibly interesting. It's it's really indicative of some of the innovative work that we're doing with um, restoration and combining um, traditional, eco uh, traditional ecological knowledge with Western science um, and helping kind of um, get the word out. And, um, and, and I, should, I should mention that partnership specifically um, really works closely with the Kroop tribe, namely. And um, you know, some of the other tools, just uh, quickly that we're utilizing, Luna mentioned um, them a little bit. Uh, you know, to, to help share what we have going on is, uh, is the annual report. Um, we're doing our regular newsletters, um, also producing plans and documents um, like the post-fire um, management recommendations that we, um, that we published and, and put out earlier this spring. Um, so that's some of those. And then additionally, you know, we're utilizing our, our social network um, or our, our social media channels and um, getting the word out with, with what we have going on as much as we can through those. And um, that's all I have, Luna. And um, I'll kick it back to you. Great, I'm almost there, sorry about that. So, uh, you know, there um, aren't really any questions, but uh, if folks do have questions, please feel free to um, add that. I, um, Jody, am attempting to highlight the panelists here. I don't know um, that I can do that right at this minute. Um, but I think a lot of the folks who, who were speaking are going to um, also be here this afternoon. So please, uh, you know, enjoy your lunch. If you think of questions um, over lunch, uh, please do put them in that Q&A and we'll see you back uh, at 1230.